Guadalcanal. The Marines took it, then held it. The Japs counterattacked time after time and failed. For five long, bloody months, the Marines held their ground. This is their story, the inside story of what they did and what they did without. But it's your story, too. You who built the ships that took us over. You who made the equipment that beat off the Japs. You who kept the supplies coming that kept us going. And you who made the airplanes that saved the day. The battle for Guadalcanal proved that even on that distant Pacific island, victory or defeat hung not only on the men on the firing line, but on how well you folks back home carried out your share of the fight. Destination unknown. When we shoved off that fine spring morning, only the staff members knew where we were headed, and they weren't telling. All the men wanted was action, and somehow they knew it was in the wind. The Marine can always smell a fight a long ways off. It wasn't until many days after we kissed the San Francisco shoreline goodbye and waved farewell to the Golden Gate that the news of our mission broke. Colonel Hunt's notice to the troops ended with these words. Our country expects nothing but victory from us, and it shall have just that. We have worked hard and trained carefully for this action. Each of us has his assigned task. Let each vow to perform it to the utmost of his ability, with added effort for good measure. Good luck, God bless you, and to hell with the Japs. The Navy did a great job. As more and more ships joined us, it began to look like a really big show. The last day at sea was mighty rough. There wasn't much talking. Our radios were silent. This destroyer dashed back and forward, delivering messages. We rendezvoused at night. Before dawn, we were in position and ready to go. Ships exchanged messages. Crews manned their battle stations. This was the long-awaited moment. At 6.14, the big guns of a Navy cruiser opened fire on the shore. Ships all up and down the line joined in the barrage. The din was terrific. Our guns quickly found the range and plastered the entire shore. The Japs were caught completely by surprise, for there was no answering fire. Gunnery officers followed the accuracy of our shelling carefully. On shore, a supply depot burned fiercely. Our barrage had been effective. Now it was time to follow up. Men swung down over the side on cargo nets. They went calmly and in perfect order. But this morning, it was the real thing. And somehow, it seemed a long way down. <laughs> Wave after wave of landing craft swept shoreward. Overhead, a screen of fighter planes formed a protective umbrella. The beach dead ahead, and still no sign of the enemy. First boats hit the shore without opposition. Not a man was lost in the landing operations on the island of Guadalcanal. But Guadalcanal was a battle of supplies as well as men. Over 5,000 miles of ocean lay between our island and San Francisco, and grocery deliveries couldn't be too regular. Even more important than food was the equipment we brought with us. Gasoline, for example, was worth its weight in gold. This bar
barbed wire helped break up one of the Japs' most dangerous attacks. We could have used a lot more of it. Machine gun nests were dug and communication wires sprung up immediately. If you've been wondering what a foxhole was really like, take a good look. These foxholes were a home sweet home for many a Marine, often for as long as 10 days at a time. In deserted Jap camps, we found that our naval barrage had been mighty effective. They were in such a hurry to get away that they abandoned huge stocks of materiel. Sergeant Arndt, who later shot over a dozen Jap snipers, put on this captured uniform to show how they camouflaged themselves against the jungle background. Their rifles were longer than ours, but not nearly as accurate. Climbing spikes helped Jap snipers to mount trees easily. The Jap and the jungle were both enemies. Together, like this, they made a dangerous foe. This was a Japanese flamethrower. Our men tried out all captured weapons to get the hang of them. They got a big kick out of turning Jap guns around and shelling the enemy with them. But for dependability, American equipment was far superior. As one of the Marines told me, hell, Major, we're American troops, and we just naturally want American weapons. In a tight spot, we want to know our guns and ammunition aren't going to let us down. That's why we look for that good old label, Made in the USA. On August 8th, the day after the landing, the Marines marched out and took Henderson Field. Except for some scattered sniping, the enemy put up no organized resistance. Henderson Field was really the key to our entire operation. For whoever would control the island of Guadalcanal must also control the air over it. One of the first moves was to run up the Stars and Stripes. There was a lot of work to be done before planes could use the field. It was chock full of shell craters. Most of them had to be filled in and rolled smooth. Some were used as observation posts and gun emplacements and set up for business by their crews. The Marines and Seabees rushed the field through on the double. They used everything they could lay their hands on, including Jap steamrollers. But American machinery from back home did most of the heavy work. Some of the farm boys were kind of homesick running these tractors. Even before the runways were completed, our planes were taking off. Marine pilots and Army and Navy airmen worked tirelessly as one great team, flying SBDs, Air Cobras, and Grumman Wildcats. They were real heroes, those sky fighters, and no one thought more highly of them than our own troops cheering them on from below. It took thousands of gallons of gasoline a week to keep our planes in the air, and we operated on a slim margin. Once we were down to a single day's supply when the Navy came to our rescue just in time. last planes are flying fortresses. The Marines used to call them those big, beautiful things. We planned our defense of the airfield carefully. Here at headquarters tents, Colonel Thomas presided over a group of officers and men mapping out an operational plan. Meanwhile, jeeps, command cars, and marine working parties headed down the jungle road and marched over the engineer's bridge, built by our own men. Their mission was to strengthen the key strategic ridges around the airfield, immensely important defensive positions. 
this particular hilltop became known as Bloody Ridge. Looks harmless, doesn't it? Yet later, some of the fiercest fighting of the whole campaign took place here. The first job was to clear away the underbrush. The Marines preferred fighting to this kind of work. Observation posts were hastily constructed. Frontline foxholes were dug, along with deeper and wider pits for machine guns. Favorite song of this Marine was You'll Be So Nice to Come Home To. Our own artillery continually pounded Jap positions to break up masses of enemy troops. These 105 millimeter field guns did a lot of damage at long range. Frequently, our gun crews maintained this fire all day long when Jap concentrations became dangerous. American gun batteries proved far more accurate than the Japs. A plain spotter warns, here comes the Japs. To every man on Guadalcanal, this was an all too familiar sight. Jap bombers outlined in silver against the sky. Jap plane is hit. Watch it fall behind the trees. A machine gun crew cuts loose as the Japs go by. Another hit. Out of control, the Jap plane plunges toward the water. End of another Jap raider. But sometimes, by sheer weight of numbers, the Japs broke through. They took their toll of men and planes. They tore huge bomb craters in the runways. They wrecked buildings and they set fire to oil stores. But no matter how often they came over, or how hard they tried, they never succeeded in putting Henderson Field out of commission. Even before the enemy attacks had ceased, American repair crews were on the job. Yes, these are our planes. But for every plane we lost, the Japs lost five. For every pilot, the ratio was even higher. And even these planes weren't completely out of the fight, for our mechanics salvaged everything but the bullet holes in repairing damaged machines. Time meant everything down here. When new planes didn't arrive on schedule, our pilots flew the best they had. The badly wounded were rushed direct by a hospital plane nearby island bases out of reach of Jap bombers. Minor casualties and sick list patients recuperated in the local hospital stations. Guadalcanal's one and only refrigerator operated by kerosene, saved plenty of lives. We bathed and did our laundry in the river whenever there was a lull in the fighting. But the dirt, like the Japs themselves, kept coming back. Today, an American supply ship came in. So tonight, we ate like kings. Hot biscuits coming up. We cooked with a field stove and a Jap safe converted into a griddle. Imagine what a meal like this meant to the Marines after a stretch of emergency field rations and Jap rice. We watched the bulletin board like hawks. News from home, picked up at night by radio, was posted regularly. The big question, what's the number one song this week? Most numerous among Jap prisoners were members of labor battalions called termites by the Marines. Most of them, when captured, didn't seem to take their fate too hard. 
Expecting to be tortured, Japs were amazed to be given humane first aid treatment. But compared to Jap dead, prisoners were few and far between. Thousands of Japs were killed in the savage fighting on Guadalcanal. As many as 800 died in a single night's engagement. Yet, as General Vandegrift wrote home, even though we lose one man to the Japs' ten, that is still too high a ratio. They are such fine men, these boys of mine. They are doing their job in the best Marine tradition, and I could add nothing to it. From abandoned enemy equipment, many a Marine brought back his own personal souvenir. Corporal Barney Ross, later promoted to sergeant, received a captured Jap flag right on the field of battle. When he visited Guadalcanal, Admiral Nimitz, chief of the Pacific Fleet, decorated a few of the many heroes. This is Colonel Edson, who led a Marine Raider Battalion. In March, the entire 1st Marine Division was sighted by President Roosevelt. Next, you will see three crack Marine pilots, Major Smith, Major Gaylor, and Captain Carl. Here's Major General Vandergrift, Marine leader, with Admiral Nimitz. Before we left the island, we saluted our dead, the Marines who will never come home. Our welcome relief arrived at last. The United States Army came in to take over. That first wave of doughboys sure looked good to us as they hit the beach. These troops were fresh, completely equipped, even to rags, their mascot. We knew we were leaving Guadalcanal in good hands. Then down the roads we had trod so often, out of the foxholes and the jungle in which we had fought so long came we Marines, heading for the ships that were to take us out of the battle zone. One last look. The American flag still flew over Guadalcanal. Taking and holding of Guadalcanal represents a victory of immense strategic importance. That the Japs knew this as well as we did is proven by the high price in warships, and airplanes, and men they were willing to pay in their futile attempts to recapture the island. In our hands, Guadalcanal represents an unsinkable aircraft carrier, stopping further Jap advances and from which we, in turn, can strike again and again at other Japanese bases. When and where the Marines will attack next, I cannot tell. But attack they will, repeatedly and with determination. And this I can tell you. Whenever and wherever the Marines strike, they will want again the all-important backing of you folks on the production line at home. They will need it in the same full measure you supported them, those never-to-be-forgotten foxholes of Guadalcanal. Mm -hmm.